I think that what makes it confusing is when you go into these domains, the encounter is an emotionally powerful one. And, and the situation is so novel that the experience tends to assume that this emotional power is coming from the input. It's not. It's coming from the encounter with the input. I mean, it's like posing the question, can you make a, a stirring record of the Grand Canyon? Yes, you can with uh, helicopter-mounted cameras and this sort of thing. But the emotion you have watching that, you bring to it. So the psychedelic dimension is objective but it's also so awesome and and so different from what we know that it encourages and promotes and triggers awe in us and so we bring something to it which we can never image or uh, or reduce to a, a verbal description or a piece of film but in principle i think the thing itself is just more of reality it's like the heart of the cell, the radar maps of the Venusian surface, the center of the atom. I mean, these are real but this places. kind of reality, we don't need more of this. We've already got so much. No, we need more of, our, of this mental um, logos world. It's the logos world that we've lost the connection with. And so these computer programs, psychedelic drugs, dynamic modeling schemes are the equivalent of probes like Voyager, uh, they're, but they're sent not to an alien planet, but to an alien phase space of some sort, but one that we need connection to. Well, I don't know, it seems to me that art or, or that mind responds, it has an affinity for itself, and if it's universal, then it has an affinity for the universal mind. What's interesting about the example of the kaleidoscope is it's boring after a few minutes. We all agree on that. If you analyze how it works it, and take it apart, the base uh, units in most kaleidoscopes are pieces of broken glass, pebbles, things like this, detritus, junk, <laughs> and, and somehow uh, splitting this into six sections with a mirror and putting it in heavy oil is supposed to bring you to the realm of something watchable and interesting, but it isn't. The brain machines being produced in Germany are the same way. All pattern seems to be to quickly lose its charm unless it's pattern that has been put through the sieve of minds, any mind, so that when uh, so that we enjoy looking at ruins and uh, the artifacts of vanished civilizations uh, a lot more than mm -hmm. random arrangements of natural objects. So it seems to me what we're looking for when we say it's like a DMT trip, the, the MPPI data on chaos, then what we're saying is, aha, here in this pattern there is the footstep of the footprint of meaning. It's as though an architect passed through here and so we can appreciate it. So we're always looking for the betraying presence of an order that is more than an order of, I don't know even how to say it, economy, I guess. We look for an aesthetic order. And when we find that, then we have this reciprocal sense of recognition and transcendence. And this is what uh, the psychedelic experience provides in spades. Now a critic of the psychedelic experience would object, of course it's made of mind, it's made of your mind. <laughs> uh, but for the psychedelic voyager, this does not seem to be obvious. The intuition is, it is made of mind, but it is not made of my mind. So then either there's an identity problem, or uh, 
a real frontier of communication is being crossed. But I think when we say we look for living pattern or aesthetically satisfying order, what we really mean is we look for the sign that mind has somehow touched the stochastic processes of, uh, of nature. Seeing language, I, I regard language as some kind of project that is uncompleted as we sit here that it isn't the transfer of thought and intention into speech, that doesn't do it. I mean, clearly, you know, the whole world is held together by small mouth noises, and it's only <laughs> barely held together by small mouth noises. If we could uh, have a tighter network of communication, we would, in a sense, be a less diffuse species. Communication, the lack of it, is what's shoving us over the brink into possible planetary catastrophe of the psychedelic experience because then you see that uh, if you buy in to the idea that psychedelics somehow are showing you the evolutionary path yet to be followed then it seems obvious that what it entails is a further completion of the project of language. Maybe what all this technology is about is actually a more explicit condensation of the word. I mean, it is interesting that modernity is characterized by uh, an ever more explicit evocation of the image. I mean, you just have to go back a hundred years and the best anything could do is an albumen tint photograph now we have you know color lithography HD TV, HD TV <laughs> high speed printing uh, uh, virtual reality it's as though you know language is becoming uh, the word is becoming flesh and condensing into the visual realm would make it would be almost a kind of telepathy compared to the kind of linguistic reality we're living in. There's been actually a huge amount of discussion about this difference between so-called print linear cultures and oral aboriginal cultures. This is what McLuhan's whole work was about and saying that somehow the symbolic signification of language first through writing and then through printing um, has created, um, has had all kinds of effects on the evolution of the Western mind that we, until McLuhan, were totally unaware of. I mean, he believes that the linear, uniform quality of print creates the intellectual preconditions for the acceptance of an idea like democracy that you would never get that notion. The Greeks invented it. They had a phonetic alphabet. Uh, uh, modern industrial methods of production based on interchangeable parts. He felt that was inconceivable except by a print culture that had the notion of movable type. Uh, the idea of the citizen is a uniformitarian impulse laid over the biological diversity of our individuality that could never have occurred in a culture without print. So the, the bottom line in the McLuhanist analysis is that uh, we tend to be incredibly naive about the information processing technologies we put in place because all we care about is input and output, and what we don't understand is it's the plumbing that this, between the input and the output that gives a culture its whole tone, its values, its implicit political assumptions, its attitude toward nature, so forth and so on, and that what we are is a print culture, you know, linear, 
hierarchical were, what we were what we were yes we're undergoing a transition in the 20th century but the intellectuals unfortunately at the top of the pyramid are the last to get the news I mean they're still pouring over Locke and Hegel when you know what's really happening is guns and roses and nirvana and I don't mean the Buddhist state of transcendence uh, so culture tends to be ruled by the people who are uh, the last to get the news in terms of new technologies which are reshaping the culture like I think all this <coughs> beefing about the death of literacy you might as well beef about the passing of the high button shoe or the beaver hat I mean literacy is finished it's, it was a phase it's not to be preserved by anyone other than curators the rest of us are going to live obviously in a, in a culture shaped by new forms of media